of those events. I'm very happy to turn the Zoom room floor over to the two Steves and let them talk about what they're doing rather than hearing it from me. So Steve and Steve, uh, welcome. And everyone uh, look to get a copy of The Art of Activism if you don't have it already. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Michael. Um, well, just introduce myself, um, and then now Steve to introduce himself. Um, my name is Steve Duncombe, and I am the co-author of this book and the co-founder of the Center for Artistic Activism. I also have a really, 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 really long history with what was then the New York Marxist School. Um, and um, if you ever use the bathroom in Chelsea, you can thank me. Um, I did not, I was not responsible for any ideological debates. I was responsible for fixing the plumbing and sanding the floors. Um, so on those floors that you walked and on that shitter that you shat, you can thank me. Um, Steve, over to you. I thought you were going to take credit for some like remarkable graffiti or something that was written on the wall. <laughs> Um, My job was to actually clean up the graffiti, like this sectarian <laughs> graffiti that made its way to the bathroom. <laughs> um, my name is Steve Lambert. I, uh, my background's as an artist. I met Steve about 12 years ago because of his book, Dream, which maybe some of you know. And um, I had recently moved to New York from the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, and everyone told me you have to meet Steve Duncombe. And that actually ended up sort of being the beginning of, of this book. Um, yeah, what else do we need? Oh, and then we should, we should talk a little bit about the Center for Artistic Activism. Yeah, yeah, and also let's just drop back for a second, Steve, and talk about, you know, our dissatisfactions with art and activism a bit, because that is what really drives sure. us together. Yeah, yeah, I think both of us were came from like a bit of skepticism. I had been in the San Francisco Bay Area working with groups like the... Um, San Francisco Print Collective. At the same time I was in art school, I was fighting to, at the beginning of when I started art school and when I ended art school, it was bookended by two different illegal evictions during the first dot-com boom. So, um, you know, while I was in this sort of monastery looking uh, art school up uh, in North Beach, I'd come back home to the mission and then file paperwork in San Francisco Superior Court to like prevent myself from being homeless. And after a while, that the contradiction and the contrast between those, my my Tuesday and my Wednesday basically um, got to be pretty overwhelming. And so I was trying to figure out how I could have impact on real things like, you know, what was going on in the neighborhood and fighting battles in court and the law um, with what I had spent a lot of time on, which was like becoming, trying to become a, as as good an artist as I could. And I had made some progress but it just felt kind of powerless. So anyway, I was trying to put those two together and I found other people that were, but um, you know, for me, the, the, the consequences were really high stakes. And so I wanted to know that what we were doing was actually doing something, that it was working. Um, that if we put up a bunch of posters around the neighborhood about the upcoming election, that it actually did impact the election. And if we were gonna put a bunch of time and energy into it, that that time and energy was being sort of as effective as possible. Um, and so when I found Steve, I thought he might know because his, he has a background in sociology and history and, and research. And so um, I, I kind of found him <laughs> at a party I crashed and, and like made friends with him because I wanted answers. And I crashed the same party actually. It was the nation party. Neither of us had been invited. Um, uh, but we, they did have free booze, so that actually worked pretty well. Uh, yeah. But my journey to get there um, was as an activist. Even before I got involved with the New York Marxist School, I'd been an activist. Um, I helped form a community organization, the Lower East Side, called the Lower East Side Collective. Um, and a couple of things were happening. One is, in the early years of my activism, um, I was frustrated with the protests that I was going to and the, actually the demonstrations that I was helping organize. They seemed more like eating spinach than they did like a joyful exuberance and bringing on the revolution. Um, and they were just kind of pro, they kind of, it was a formula that had been worked out years and years before. What do we do? We get people on the streets. What do we do? We have three, year, three word chants. What do we do? We hold up posters. 
Um, and it just, it felt very stale and tired. But about that same time, um, ACT UP happened. And ACT UP brought a sort of a different sensibility around art and aesthetics um, into the activist scene. And then I was doing community organizing in the Lower East Side, which at that time um, had a lot of artists. And so when you have a community meeting or a community action meeting, and half the people in there are artists, and you start saying things like, well, let's have a demonstration, they all of a sudden start to bring that artist brain into the room and start thinking things like, well, what if we think about a demonstration as a performance? Or what is the music going to be like? Or what is the entry strategies? And so seeing this around, but still felt really trapped by this kind of the, the how do you, and only this sense? crowd will understand this. <laughs> um, that history weighs like a nightmare on the brain of the living, is that we were acting out scripts um, over and over again without really being innovative. And Steve was doing this really innovative, great artwork at, um, out West. And so I thought he might have all the answers. Um, and the first thing we realized is neither of us had the answers. Um, and so what we started to do was we started to talk to a lot of people. We started to talk to people at ACT UP. We started to talk to artists whose work we really um, admired. We talked to activists who we thought were being really creative and really asked them what they were doing, why they were doing it, and how did they know if it actually worked. And that was the beginning of something which was called the Center for Artistic Activism. Yeah. So um, maybe this is a good point for me to read the opening of the book. Sure. Okay. Um, here we go. Do we, do we have slides for it? Yeah, it's going to be a surprise. It's going to be a oh, reveal. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Yeah, get ready. Okay, um, a decade ago, a group of idealistic artists traveled to the countryside of their small Western Balkans nation with a noble objective of bringing art to the people. When they got to one of the towns, however, the people there didn't want to talk about art. They wanted to talk about potholes, big gaping potholes in the main streets of the town that were deep enough to break a car's axle and create a small lake when it rained. Potholes that hadn't been fixed by municipal authorities for years and were symbols of the ineptitude and corruption of the current governing regime. Meetings had been held, politicians confronted and petitions delivered, but the potholes still remained. So instead of bringing art to the people, the group decided to bring artistry to the people's problems. They borrowed some fishing poles, gathered up some buckets, and set up stools around the rain-filled pothole, and they cast their lines into the lake. Local people came out of their homes and gathered around the anglers. Curious, they looked into the buckets where they saw several fish bought earlier by the artists at a local market. They began to laugh and told their neighbors. More people arrived, enjoying the absurdity of the spectacle while discussing the problem of the pothole. As the group got bigger, someone contacted the local media, which came and took pictures and recorded the story of the pothole that hadn't been fixed. The artists shot their own video and uploaded it to YouTube. The story made it into the national media that night and the pothole was fixed by municipal authorities within a couple of days. This is artistic activism. Artistic activism is a hybrid practice that marries the creative force of art to the concrete results of activism. Common definitions of art and activism are often restrictive. Instead of perpetuating an idea that artists are separate magical beings, artistic activism allows us to cultivate the creativity we already have. Even those of us who don't define ourselves as artists have a familiarity and comfort with creativity, arts, and culture that we often don't have with politics. We make playlists of our favorite music. We sing songs at church, upload videos we've made to YouTube, assemble scrapbooks with our friends, invent new cuisines from our leftovers, and watch TV dramas or read novels before we go to bed. I'm not political is a phrase one hears often but it's a rare person who doesn't identify with some sort of creativity. We are all creative. Most people would not define themselves as activists either, yet in a sense, we, do, we all do forms of activism every day, organizing a group of people to go to a movie or picking a restaurant, lobbying parents for extra screen time or your boss for a raise, talking a friend out of a bad relationship. All being an activist really entails is having an idea of what needs to be changed and doing something about it. Yet capital A activism can still feel foreign to people and a bit daunting. It seems to take too much commitment, too much risk, and too much time. 
Oscar Wilde once quipped, the problem with socialism is that it wastes too many evenings on meetings. And that's why mixing arts and activism is so critical, because we all have a creative life. Using arts and culture and activist work lowers barriers to entry. Culture, as something familiar, can work as an access point through which organizers can approach and engage people who might be alienated from institutional political systems like voting, lobbying, campaigning, and legislating. To create a new world, we need to imagine what that world looks like. To conjure up this vision takes creativity and time to wonder. Visions of success are what get us up and out in the morning and what attract others to the hard and necessary work with us. We're talking here about utopia, not as a place to arrive at, but a point on the horizon to move towards. Art gives us the vision. Activism helps us make the road. And so we've been walking that road together uh, for about 12 years since we founded the Center for Artistic Activism. And at the core of the Center for Artistic Activism, although this is changing in the past couple of years, um, are a series of trainings that we've done um, where we work with activists all around the world. You know, see, this is actually really dated. <laughs> no, no, yeah, yeah, there's, there's more now. There's, there's a lot more moving to the east over there. Um, but we work with activists and artists in all of these um, areas around all sorts of issues. Um, and what we do is we, you know, literally will go and work with people from any place from three days to three years um, with our latest project and get them to think about if they're artists, how to be more strategic with their creativity, and if they're activists, how to be more creative with their activism. Um, and out of that experience, we created this book, um, which is about the art of activism or artistic activism. And the first thing might be, you know, okay, these guys have now been talking about artistic activism for about eight or nine minutes. What the hell is artistic activism? Um, it's usually the first question we get. Um, and so what we want to do is we put together a whole bunch of slides and we want to show you examples of artistic activism. Um, we want to talk a little bit about how it works. And we also want to pull some examples from history, which we might not think of as artistic activism, yet, Artistic strategies, techniques, and concerns are at the heart of that activism. Um, so Steve, you ready to go? Yeah, do you wanna do this uh, exercise that we do in the beginning oh, of yes, our yes, yes. Okay, so when we do we, these trainings, we usually start with an exercise. Um, and uh, do we wanna do it or maybe just lead people through it? And how it Yeah, we could lead people through it, sure. Yeah, okay. tell them how it works. Yeah. So um, one of the first things you do when we meet a bunch of people, and if we were all in a room, we could do it here. It's just to get to unwieldy with, uh, on Zoom, is we do introductions. Um, and one of the ways we do introductions is we ask people what made them become an activist, or the words we use is what made you step off the curb. We borrow a, a, a phrasing from Abby Hoffman. And we mean that quite literally, which is what made you step off the curb of the sidewalk onto the street to join a protest. But we also mean it in a grander sense, is what made you step off the curb of indifference and inactivity into deciding to become active in whatever way that you are active. Um, and, you know, people go around the room and people tell us, and so, Steve, I'm going to let you take it from here. Yeah, um, you know, sometimes they'll say, well, um, you know, I, I, I went to this lecture and we'll say, okay, well, what got you to that lecture? Like, not everyone goes to a lecture. And then they'll say, well, actually, before that, I had been involved in this, you know, um, thing that happened in my town. Um, and then... A lot, but what most people will say is describe something that goes much further back. So I remember one person in a group um, of Muslim American activists that were being targeted by the New York Police Department. And one of them said that they were in a, a Foster's Freeze or something, you know, like an ice cream shop. And they saw this person behind the counter discriminate against their own mother. And very young, but just was immediately it was like, this is wrong, you know? And um, we had 
other folks have said, like kind of rejected the question, which it's a bit of a setup, you know, but we worked with one woman. I remember she said, um, I'm, I'm black, I'm a lesbian, and I'm a sex worker. I was born off the curb, right? I just have always been. And then there, there's another uh, often group of people that say, you know, my, my mom, my, I'm a red diaper baby. My parents were communists. Or, um, and so this has just always been the way. And um, so, you know, one thing you could take from that is that, um, well, we need more communist people having children. You know, like that's going to create more activists. The other thing we need is uh, traumatic experiences for young people. But instead of that, there, there may be some other ways. Um, but what we found is that there are often these um, descriptions of emotional experience, like experiences, human experiences that involve emotion, that involve being moved either from anger or upset or just a drive, right? And what we what we usually do after is we say, okay, like, you know, we've heard from 15 of you. Um, can you just refresh us? Cause we don't remember. Did anyone here say that, say that they got involved by signing a petition? And nobody's hand goes up. Nobody's hand goes up or receiving a pamphlet or reading a white paper. And then someone will say, actually, I read a white paper. We're like, well, we've all read white papers, but that's not what you described before, right? right. Um, watching a press conference, reading a news story, uh, watching a PSA, no hands, right? Um, going to a lecture, attending a meeting, being forwarded an email, no hands, right? Retweeting a tweet. This was not how I became active as an activist. Now, and um, this, is, this is where it gets tricky because when I was an activist, and often we're working with professional activists, how we engage with the public is through this list. Yeah. If yeah. you were to do all those things, you would be very successful. Right. And no one who we've ever talked to has ever been radicalized by any of these things. Um, and instead, they're radicalized by what Steve's describing, which is these experiential, emotional, and to use an expensive word, affective, experiences. Um, now we're kind of shit out of luck actually is it, for a communication strategy um, because activists, you know, the handing out pamphlets and getting people to sign petitions and so on and so forth, all of which can be quite useful. Don't get us wrong. But in order to get to the place where people want to pick up a pamphlet or sign a petition, there needs to be something before that, which moves people to want to do that. And those things are experiential, emotional, and affective. And um, activism, by and large, um, has a, doesn't have a communication strategy to do that or an engagement strategy to do that. But the good news is, is there actually is, uh, there is a practice, which has been around for about 40,000 years, that works on the level of experiential and emotional um, and affective. And that's, of course, you know, art. Um, we go to a museum and we tell our friends about it later, this thing that really pissed us off and we really loved. And we say it moved us, right? Um, or you watch, uh, uh, or listen, or see something, you know, like a, a, a song or a, a, a movie. And it's almost hard to put into words why it affected you the way that it did. And that's what we're looking for, is that sort of motivation, that sort of movement of people that can happen before they enter into the sort of cognitive relationship, which happens by you know, reading a pamphlet, a white paper, attending um, a meeting, and so on and so forth. So it's this combination of, you know, the, the power of moving people, of affect, of that kind of emotional experiential part with the outcome-based uh, part of activism, which we don't want to minimize. You know, like, they're, uh, we're definitely <laughs> not big... Like, I, I'm an art professor. I can defend art for art's sake, but I'm not a big advocate of it. Um, and so it's this combination of art and activism that is what we call artistic activism. Um, See, this isn't helping me. I still don't really know what artistic activism is. Right. So, um, <laughs> words so, far. so we have a few examples. And, and the examples we have are um, definitely not comprehensive because the, this is a really wide-ranging group of activities that you could do, you know, like it's pretty expansive, but we're just going to show you a few things that might help kind of lay that out. And this first uh, story is about a project called the Dallas Drinking Fountain by a woman named Lauren Butterfly Woods. And 
this is, happened in Dallas, Texas, in their county records building. And what happened was they had a like a water fountain, and uh, there was a plaque above it or a sign. The sign just one day, the glue gave out or something, and it fell down. And when it fell down, it revealed a sign that was there before that said uh, whites only. And so then the county had to do something about it, right? This is 2008. And um, they had meetings and meetings trying to figure out, like, we don't just want to cover it over, but what do we do, right? And so this woman, Lauren Butterfly Woods, kind of stepped in and said, I've got a proposal. And um, the other smart thing that she did is she had her own money. <laughs> she, had, um, she had won a grant. So she wasn't asking them to spend any money. She just, do you want this or not? Um, this was the, what was there before. It was very faint, but it was there. And um, what she proposed was to make a new drinking fountain. And in the drinking fountain was a video screen. And um, when people would press the button for water, for 45 seconds, it would play video of uh, Bull Connor spraying protesters in Birmingham, Alabama. And at the end of that 40 seconds, then the water would start, right? So um, they had meetings about this. Whoops, I need to go back this way. And, uh, you know, of course, made the news and she was able to sort of have this forum to explain this. Um, and one of the in the county record or county meetings one of the commissioners said if somebody is interested and they want to learn about this and see the history that's fine but to make somebody wait 45 seconds to get a drink you basically make that water fountain inoperable and another commissioner who's black said i think it's okay to wait 45 seconds for water some of us have waited 45 years and longer and so these kinds of things were like talked about in the news there. Now, one of the things I really liked about this is that for years, it had this impact and the only form that it took was like this digital model. It didn't even exist and it did all this work, right? Um, the good news is that it got made and there was a big ceremony. There is now a water fountain with the screen in it. And if you are ever in the Dallas County Records building, it, you can go check it out. Awesome. So um, Lauren Butterfly Woods is an artist. Um, she was working as an artist and a lot of what she wanted to do was kind of start a discussion about this and to raise people's awareness about uh, the history of white supremacy and that it doesn't get solved magically. It gets solved through social struggle, which is why those images of the SCLC protests in Birmingham were so important. This next group actually kind of comes from another place, um, ends up with an artist, but actually starts with social movement actors. And um, we we're working with a bunch of folks in South Texas, young people who were immigration activists who did not have papers themselves. Um, and they told us about a campaign they had just come off of in which they were going from state to state in the deep south um, and campaigning outside of courthouses, state office buildings, who were, uh, the legislatures were passing these draconian laws against immigrants. So in some ways a very traditional campaign. But one of the things they noticed was that being without papers, one of the most profound things you feel is fear. Fear that you're just going to be walking to the supermarket and La Migra is going to pick you up. Or ICE is going to arrest your parents and deport them, and you'll come home to an empty house. And so what they wanted to do is address this idea of, you know, we don't have papers, and we're out and on the streets. Um, but they used, you know, they could have just <clears throat> gone out on the streets and said that, right? But they did a couple of creative things, which we think made their campaign much more effective. The first one was that they did this tour with a bus. Now, you notice the bus, this, this happened in what? mid 2000, you know, late 2010, 2010, 2011, sometimes around there, that bus is from 1963. Um, they did that on purpose because what they wanted to do, of course, was to draw a resonance with the freedom riders of the earlier civil rights campaign. And by drawing the connection between this 
their campaign and this previous campaign, which now is sort of passed into history as this noble um, uh, uh, struggle. The other thing you'll notice is um, on the side of the bus, you'll see all these butterflies, okay? Why butterflies? What they were combating at that time was a public image of migrants perpetrated by our last president, among others, as people who were criminals, people who were dangerous, people who were to steal jobs. So painting a negative portrait of immigrants. What they wanted to do is they wanted to replace it with positive portrait. And monarch butterflies are beautiful. Um, but also monarch butterflies do this particular thing which is they migrate from Mexico to the United States, the United States to Mexico every single year. And they don't care about border walls. Um, they just do it. And so by attaching themselves to this symbol, they put across this narrative, which migration is the most natural thing in the world. Um, that actually borders and laws are what is disturbing nature. Now they also, there's one more clever thing, which was, that um, when they would protest, they would wear these wings. Um, they would have wing-making workshops um, that were part directed by an artist. We'll meet in a few seconds. And um, when they go out on the streets, they would wear these wings. Um, and think about this. You're a police chief. These protesters come to your town. They're wearing black hoodies and Carhartt jeans. You look like a hero if you get them arrested. Okay, those are the anarchists that on Fox News, everybody's saying are, you know, taking over and so on and so forth. You've just busted Antifa. This is the best thing in the world. But arresting a bunch of kids wearing butterfly wings. I mean, the optics are terrible on that. And they understood that and they used it to their advantage and thereby evaded arrests. Um, what's cool about this project, too, is that it was done in collaboration with an artist, um, Fabiana Rodriguez, who took their images and then kind of polished them up put a slogan on it, migration is beautiful, and then created posters, uh, t-shirts, coffee mugs, basically merchandise um, that one raised funds for the movement, but also became a way that the movement could self-identify itself. Um, so it sort of created a logo system for the movement to build identity. So there's this exchange. I mean, the, the original migration is beautiful, uh, metaphor thing I think was developed by a poet and then what that was within the movement they developed it then an artist you know kind of polished it up and then gave it back so there's like an, a nice exchange going back and forth here um Steve do you want to talk about this one yeah sure and we're kind of okay. going back to the idea of the role of the individual artist here because arts activism often comes from activists or it comes from artists and works best when it's the meeting of the two there's an artist named Candy Shang um, she now lives in New York, but when she did this uh, project, she lived in New Orleans. And after Hurricane Katrina, we all know, New Orleans was flooded. <clears throat> and as the waters receded, it left all of these buildings that were boarded up. And there's a lot of discussion about what are we going to do? How are we going to rebuild New Orleans? The problem was the discussion did not include any of the people that lived in the neighborhoods in New Orleans. They were made up of bankers, real estate developers, and politicians. And so Candy said, well, the problem is, is people don't have a forum where their voice is heard. And so she did something super simple, probably cost her $200. Um, she printed up a whole bunch of stickers, like the ones you wear at a conference that says, hello, my name is so-and-so. Um, but this says, I wish this was. And she put them all over all the boarded up buildings. Um, she also left boxes of them in local stores so people could take them and put them up on buildings themselves. And what ended up happening is people started to fill them in. Um, I wish this was a butcher shop. I wish this is a bakery. And then someone else writes in, if you can get the financing, I will do the baking, right? And you can see this sort of nascent form of a vision for what New Orleans could be like taking place on the walls of these boarded up buildings. So where there was no forum, she created a forum. Now, if there's a weakness of this project, um, it's that we don't know if it ever went further than this. Um, and that's not a weakness of Candy Chang. It's just to say that this active type of artistic activism can't work on its own. It develops a desire. It develops an idea of 
wait a second, we should be being able to ask. Why aren't we asking? We have all these good ideas, but if that's going to have any real effect in the world, it will have to move into the political sphere. Um, but it kind of lights the match. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's an important thing to say is that this doesn't, you know, take the place of movements. <laughs> it's an element of a movement that, that there needs to be other things that happen. Um, this next example uh, is one of the one of my favorites. Um, there are two guys that work on it, Human and KT, and they're based in Senegal. And after the 2012 presidential election, um, there were huge demonstrations and arrests and deaths. And um, they wanted to build something more positive. Um, but what they found was that a lot of young people just were not engaged in politics. Uh, not just, not even engaged, but not informed. Um, they didn't trust the news. Anybody wearing a suit seemed to be corrupt, uh, which in their experience, you know, like there's a reason that they thought that. And um, so there, were, so there was another uh, group called Yenamar, or, which translates to fed up, basically. And they had been protesting against weak leadership in Senegal and building a political movement earlier. Um, but they were also like established hip hop artists. And so were KT and Human. So KT and Human, again, like, thinking about the bigger movement part, they took on this other element, which was how do we inform young people about um, politics in a way that they'll want to engage in, that they'll trust that they'll be excited about that and it speaks their language. And so they came up with a news, they made a news report. And the, the way I describe this for people in the US, if this makes any sense to you, is um, it's like a John Oliver show, you know, where like they go do in-depth reporting and it's funny, but it's also like very well reported, but the whole thing is a mixtape. So I'll just show you a clip of it and you can get an idea. Here we go. Microphone check. One, two. Salam alaikum. Bonjour. Okay. Bienvenue, installez-vous, on a des nouvelles pour vous. Y'a de bonnes, y'a de mauvaises, mais y'a des nouvelles pour vous. Bienvenue, installez-vous, on a des nouvelles pour vous. Y'a de bonnes, y'a de mauvaises, mais y'a des nouvelles pour vous. Incendie à la Médina, c'est Stalibé, on peur du la vie. Faut-il fermer des dards, tout le monde n'est pas de cet avis. On a tout tenté. Y avait une fille à l'aide qui était en dormation avec son petit frère aîné. Exploiter un enfant doit être puni comme un délit. Mais au Sénégal, ils font un drame pour que les langues... So... It's amazing. Um, you'll notice that they're uh, uh, speaking French in that clip. Um, they would switch. French is sort of the language of, of uh, official business, you know, in politics and government there. So speaking in French and wearing suits is sort of like this uh, deliberate move that they're doing. But um, the other KT who they'll cut to and he'll do the next story would speak in Wolof, which was like a... a uh, a more regional language that's spoken by people on the street. They would do um, remote reports and have people in other countries that would be filming in those countries and pretending to be on a satellite with like a headphone and like talking back and forth. It was very, it's very sophisticated the way they do it. Um, and then incorporating other languages. They'd have a women report, and, um, which also was kind of uncommon. But one of the really successful things about this project is it didn't just stay in Senegal, it very quickly spread. And so within a few weeks, there was uh, another hip hop news program being made in Uganda and then others in other countries around the uh, continent and then jumped the continent and they had a Jamaican uh, news show called Listen Me News that was all dance hall, right? So they, and they helped people adapt it to that local culture. So um, what else am I missing, Steve? Is there anything else? I think you got it. And I just want to underscore that last thing you said about local culture, which is artistic activism works when it speaks to the local culture and, so, and to the local population. So in Senegal, 60% of the people in Senegal are under 18. Um, and so young people are a really, really important part of that country. And hip hop is their language, right? But you move it to Jamaica, 
and it's going to be dance hall. And <laughs> well, was, last time I was talking to KT, reminded me, uh, said, oh, but, you know, they're doing it in Russia now. And I have no idea what they're doing in Russia. And the great thing is he didn't even know about it. Um, and so it's gotten so popular that it's actually kind of taken on a life of its own as a form of, um, of uh, dispersing information. And, and I think you know, that, that cultural specificity is really good for this example. Is excellent. Okay. So the next one's about, um, it's actually not activists from the street. It's not artists, um, although artist and an activist, but actually an initiative started by a mayor, um, a mayor of Bogota, Colombia, named Antanas Macas. And Antanas Macas was not your usual mayor. Um, he had been a philosophy professor and rector of the university. Um, and when he got elected, he promised to use creativity um, in order to just try to solve problems. One of the problems that Bogota, Colombia faced was traffic deaths. Um, people paid no attention whatsoever to, well, it's kind of like New York City that way, right? Um, they worse, worse. Paid attention, yeah, like you know, a walk sign or a no walk sign. Um, the, but unlike New York City, although maybe a little bit like the scooters, um, you know, the traffic paid no attention to red lights, green lights, and so on and so forth. So you had a lot of traffic fatalities. Um, and so the first thing he did, being a ex-professor, is he did a survey of the population. And what he found out was that increasing the amount of payment on a fine or enforcement was not going to work because the traffic police were notoriously corrupt and would shake people down for money. So people had no faith in the law whatsoever. And so you could um, enforce it more, or you could ask people to do more fines. They still weren't going to pay the fines, um, and it wasn't going to stop them from doing whatever what they want to do. However, what he did find out was that public humiliation and saving face was really important to people in Bogota, Colombia. So he said, okay, understanding that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fire all of the traffic officers in the entire city. Was it 270, something of that nature? Yeah, um, some, yeah. And then he hired in their place, although he did offer them a job back if they wanted to do this, mimes. And so mimes directed traffic in Bogota, Colombia, uh, which basically means like if you jaywalked, you'd have a mime following you, making fun of you. Um, and if someone went through a traffic, you know, uh, through a, a zebra down there, what you'd have is someone holding up something saying, incorrecto, right? And basically it would get everybody around laughing at the person who thought they were cool because they were going to do this or humiliating the bus driver who was trying to actually get through. Um, and it was so effective that traffic dro um, deaths dropped by 50%. Um, so a very creative way of going about solving a very boring problem, um, very effective because it was very affective and it was so effective that it actually got exported to other cities. Some of these pictures are actually from um, Venezuela and Caracas. And what's interesting about it is it didn't work too well in other places. Um, you can imagine a mime directing traffic in New York City. Someone would just throw something at them or maybe just hit them, right? Um, or a mime in Paris, people would stop and say, oh, look at this, this is so beautiful. This is, you know, part of our culture and so on and so forth. It only worked in that moment, in that place. Um, and that is true for all artistic actions. It has to work with the signs and the symbols and the stories and the spectacles, which are local. This next one is from a, a Chinese city in Chongqing. And um, what's challenging about doing any kind of political action or protest in China is that it's just straight up illegal. <laughs> And so um, how do you make a statement in that country? And what um, this group of activists did was first they decided to take the words of the premier um, and, and kind of quote them back. So um, she had said that, they, that the, uh, China, it was necessary for China to stage a war on smog. And it was probably like an empty statement, uh, something to quell some uh, upset in the country or internationally. But nonetheless, he said, we're going to declare war on smog. And so they used that phrase and said, we are, we are part of the war on smog. And then they did things like um, go around and 
stage wedding photos in the country. So um, it, Steve and I did a workshop at the Queens Museum on Saturdays, and there was just nonstop brides and grooms being photographed in front of the big sphere there, you know? It's just a thing, and this is very, very much a thing in China where people will get their picture taken in front of different landmarks in the city. So they did this. They dressed up like bride and groom and then uh, wore gas masks. And this is the, the big kiss that they're doing here. So <laughs> mask to mask. Um, the other thing they did was they had young people perform a ballet in gas masks. And when the police came, um, they, everyone could just say, oh, no, no, this is a dance performance, right? And we're, it's part of the war on smog. And everyone kind of knew it was critical, it was a little satirical, a little ironic, but um, it allowed them to kind of slip under the radar. And whereas protests as usual would get uh, media attention and police attention, <laughs> um, this could be, this could, there's like a plausible deniability here. And what we found is that um, artistic activism often works especially well in repressive regimes because it can read differently. It can, it can kind of um, shape shift and take different forms. And um, we, you know, we've done actions. We did an action in Barcelona once where everyone was wearing lab coats because uh, it was in front of a hospital. And when the security came and the police, they thought our, all of us were doctors because we were wearing lab coats and we were near a hospital. And they said, oh, it's great. Yeah, you're doctors, way to go, you know? So, um, so these kinds of things, like when people don't know that it's not just explicitly a protest, it doesn't have the, all the imagery and the symbols of being a protest, they have to make sense of it. Um, and there's an opportunity there to work with that. So Steve, why don't you do this one? Yeah, just one more thing. And actually I've just been reading this book about protest culture in China, um, which is a really good book, by the way. Um, and I didn't know this until I wrote this book, is that traditionally protest, how protest works in China, is that you, act, that you direct your message to central leadership and say, we love you, President Xi, and we are supporting you. And so it fit into this whole narrative, and it's these local people that are bad, the local corruption and so on and so forth, but save us national government, we're trying, we're loyal troops for you. And so I didn't know until I read this, that that just fits into a Chinese protest tradition. Um, mm, so funny. anyways, this next one is by these two architects and artists, Virginia San Fratello and Ronald Rial. And um, here's the wall, you know, that wonderful, beautiful wall that our last president has deeded us with. It's this ugly thing which separates people. Um, and they didn't, a very little simple, again, a simple gesture. They're artists, they're architects, they're not activists. But they did a simple gesture which highlighted the ridiculousness of this wall. Um, and the bringing people together. They built, they built a, 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 a seesaw. And they got people on Mexican side and on the U.S. side to actually cooperate and have fun together. And you, if you just click that, I think it's a gift. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and it's just this kind of wonderful little silly thing, but it got a lot of media attention. And of course, the story is all about the joy of these people. And this wall just looks inhuman, ridiculous. And there's the triumph of the human spirit and so on and so forth that will actually exist and will continue to exist regardless of this wall. Now, if it just stays at a teeter-totter thing, it's clever, it's cute. Um, but I found out about this through activist channels. And so activists then kind of use this as a way to kind of broach the whole issue about the inhumanity of the wall, um, but through a clever way and an attractive way and a surprising way, as opposed to say, read this document, read this white paper, read this pamphlet and so on. Yeah. Um, so we have two more. Does that sound good, Steve? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. So this know. is uh, from... What? I'm going to take this one because I know you love telling the next story. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this one um, is from HIV Awareness. Uh, it's about HIV Awareness, and it happens at Pride Week in Helsinki. Um, and I get it. 
I'm happy to, to uh, take this one because I don't really have to say anything. Um, I think it says everything. I don't speak Finnish. Steve doesn't speak Finnish. Um, maybe some of you do, but it doesn't really matter. And that's the beauty of this piece. No ei se nyt tunnu enää niin pahalle. Tästä on kahdeksan vuotta sitten aikaa jo, että tämä nyt on ihan sille tutuksi tullut jo tämä asia mulle, mutta kun se ei edelleenkään jo tuttu kaikille, niin tota, ihan hyvä. Että mä en ole vaarallinen ihminen, enkä tarutakaan ihmisiä sillä, että voidaan ihan kosketellakin. Kiitos samoin, kiitos. Joo. Hei. Hei, kiitos. Kiitos, tänkö hyvä. Kiitos. 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 incredibly moving um, performance and moving video and he could have just stood up on a soapbox and said look you can't get HIV by touching people there's a lot of misinformation out there the truth is it can be only be spread in these ways and some people would have stopped maybe listened um, probably the people that already knew that in the first place but there's really kind of human beautiful performance um, communicated as much about the humanity of people with HIV and also the humanity of connection between people as any sort of pamphlet could have done. There's also something else which you might not think about, and that's the point, which is this didn't happen in real time. In real time, probably over the course of two hours, some people came up at the beginning and then some, there's long periods of time where people don't come up and then four people came up and so on. But he edited it so it starts where no one is touching him or talking to him and then over time everybody is. And Steve brought up the fact once that he actually showed it once without the music and it is not as moving. And so this succeeded as a performance, but it succeeded much more, it was distributed much more widely as a video. Um, and so it's about, you know, one, you do the performance, but also the documentation of it and then the editing of it heightened the emotional impact of this piece. So the other thing I would say is that it actually is truer than if you just set up like a security camera and showed, here's what happened between 12 and 2 p.m., right? Like that that wouldn't communicate what his experience was and that the video that we see is closer to what it actually felt like and, and, and we'll, that's important yeah and as we'll talk about later um sometimes you need to perform reality 
in order for it to be really felt. Yeah. So um, this is our last example. Um, it's from a, ar another architect named Alfredo Yar. Um, and Alfredo's also an artist, well-known artist. And what happens when you're a pretty successful artist is you get invited to do projects in different parts of the world. So he was invited to Skogal, Sweden. And um, if you've not been to Skogal, this is, this is a typical yep. site. Hey, you want to to you that we've never, ever, we've done this all over the world. We know nobody who's ever been to Skogal, Sweden. Right, right. Yeah, so he was invited to Skogal, Sweden to do a project. And Skogal is like a lumber paper town. There's one company there. And um, they own this big factory where they make huge sheets of paper and the paper is very specific paper it's for like milk cartons so it's coated and um they gave him a tour they said you know here's our town here's the factory um and of course the town provides everything for the people that work there and their families so they have a grocery store they have a library they have a gym and it's all owned by the factory and provided to the people that live there and so you know Here's the grocery store. Here's the library. Here's the kids' playground. Here's the gym. And he says, oh, this is great. Thank you. And uh, at the end of the tour, he says, well, where is the art museum? And they said, ah, yeah, we don't have an art museum. This is why we bring artists in, because we want people to see art, but we don't have a building. And he said, oh, I see. Okay. Well, what I'll do for my project then is we'll build you a museum, and we'll build it out of the paper and the wood that you all have here. And this is what he designed and they built. Um, you see those long logs are built from the trees that were in that yard and the paper, the coated paper used for the walls. And it's the local museum. And it was called the 24 hour museum. And he asked people in the town to bring art that they made and put it in the museum. So you had like kids drawings that would be on the refrigerator uh, in other parts of the city in there and then also you know someone who is a hobbyist sculptor or a photographer on the weekends they would have their artwork in there so everyone came because they wanted to you know it was a new building this new museum all their friends had artwork in it um the mayor came and cut the ribbon um there was an umpa band because it's sweden um that played to celebrate and then at, like any art opening it was packed um very popular people are having a great time and then eventually they say, hey, uh, why is this called the 24-hour museum? Is it open 24 hours? And he said, no, no, it's because in 24 hours we're going to burn it down. And they said, uh, what? <laughs> he said, yeah, we're going to take all the artwork out of it and we're going to burn it down in 24 hours. It exists for 24 hours. And they said, no, 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 we, <laughs> that's crazy. Like, we like this museum. And he said, yeah, sorry, that's the project. We're going to burn it down at the end of 24 hours. And so then those people were like, well, this guy's nuts, you know. And so they went to the mayor and they said, hey, the artist has like lost it. He said in, in tomorrow they're going to he wants to burn the museum down. And the mayor was like, yeah, that was the deal that we made. Like, that's the project. He builds a museum and then he burns it down. <laughs> and they said, uh, well, you know, OK, so the, the artists and the mayor are in on this. So they went. To the fire department and they said look the artists and the mayor like they've lost their minds like they they, they said they're going to burn this museum down tomorrow you're the fire department you have to stop it and the folks at the fire department said no 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 that's not true they're not they're not burning it down we're burning it down we're the fire department you know so the next day they they tried as much as they could but in the end they took all the artwork out and lit the museum on fire and burned it down. And one time we were presenting this and we got to this point and uh, a woman, this was in Texas, kind of stood up in the back and she said, this is very disempowering. <laughs> and I said, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it would be. Um, but it's not the end of the story. And this is the amazing thing about this project. So Alfredo leaves Sweden. He comes back to New York City where he lives. Um, and six weeks later, gets a phone call from the mayor. And the mayor says, people here have continued to talk and get together. And they decided they want a permanent museum. And they want you to be the architect. 
And what he managed to do was cultivate this desire in the, that, the, those people there to ask for something for the first time, right? Up until that point, everything had been provided. If you want a library, well, we have a library, right? But there was no need for them to do anything. And he got them, he turned them into activists. And the thing that we want, always say whenever we present this is that this will not work for you. Like arson is not going to get you an infrastructure project. <laughs> but the idea of like, how do we make the people, instead of providing for them or like doing it for them, how do you make people so motivated that they will organize themselves? And that is, again, through these affective emotional experiences. And when Steve and I went back and looked at history, we're like, when did this start, right? Um, Seattle. Seattle had art in it. That's for sure. But, and Steve brought up ACT UP, you know, like, well, there was ACT UP before that. And then we started going further and further back. And what we realized is that all successful activism, when you look at it closely, involves some sort of arts and culture, right? It might, we might remember elements of the civil rights movement as like, oh, well, they did sit-ins. And that's just a standard activist tactic. But the thing to remember is it wasn't at the time. <laughs> that was an innovation, right? So all successful activism is, involves the arts. And then it gets historicized and remembered and turned into a tradition that lose, then the creativity gets taken out of it. But, um, you know, this is, this is what we found. And we can talk about this a bit. Um, Steve, did you want to take this? Yeah, I'll just start it. And I think, you know, I'm just looking at the time. We'll probably not get to all the examples, but we can get to one or two. Sure. Uh, so uh, what's the next slide? All the uh, options. Yeah. Here. yeah, so essentially, I don't know what that TH is, maybe two come or something like that. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, this is what we've been looking at, right? And actually, we usually start, depending where we are in the world, with the Jesus of Nazareth as an artistic activism or the Prophet Muhammad. Um, once we were working for... Uh, for uh, Jewish Voices for Peace. So we, I, we worked with a rabbi and came up with a great one about Moses as a creative activist. Um, and we don't have time to do even close to this. We've never had time to do this. Uh, so we're gonna talk probably just about the civil rights movement. I don't think we're gonna get to the black, brown and red power. Um, but just to go through a couple of familiar images and maybe defamiliarize them for you and to think about the sort of artistic component. So the first picture you're gonna recognize immediately. Rosa Parks, okay? Now, for the folks in this room, we don't need to tell you who Rosa Parks is, but I'll tell you what my sons learned in New York City Public School. Um, she was a tired seamstress who after a long day at work, got onto a bus in Montgomery, Alabama, and refused to give up her seat to a white man, which was the custom and the law of the period. And in that moment, she made history and started the civil rights movement. Now, we all know that's bullshit. I mean, she did, she, Rosa Parks was a seamstress. She was tired. Um, it was kind of an opening salvo um, to introduce the civil rights movement to the rest of America. But she was a trained organizer. She was a secretary of the NAACP in Montgomery, Alabama. She'd been trained at the Highlander Institute. She'd worked on the defense of the Scottsboro Boys. She was an activist. Yet that myth was mobilized by the civil rights movement because they wanted to make her into an every woman. Um, they didn't want people to think of this as something that only a professional activist would do. Um, and they picked Rosa Parks because they knew she could play the role, or rather she picked herself because she knew she could play the role. In fact, someone had been arrested a month earlier, a young woman, Claudette Collins, for the same thing. And while they got her out of jail, they didn't make the campaign around her because she was young, she was inexperienced, and she was unwed and pregnant. Um, they needed someone like Rosa Parks. Um, and this photo, this iconic photo, this is the, the reveal, there's this white guy in the back. And again, with this crowd, you probably know who this white guy is, but I remember first you know, coming into contact with this and I was like, ah, that's the white guy who she didn't give up her seat to. He is kind of scowling, right? And then, you know, it doesn't take much to think, wait a second, he's not gonna sit for a photo. And then, wait a second, there was no photographer there. There's a bunch of angry white people and police. They're not going to let a photographer get this beautiful shot. And so I did a little digging, and 
This photo was taken a year later. It was taken on the anniversary. And so this photo, which becomes the image in the popular mindset of Rosa Parks refusing to give her receipt, is a staged photograph a year later. And that white guy is an Associated Press reporter um, who is sympathetic to the civil rights cause, which the photographer is like, look, we need some contrast here. White guy, get up there, sit behind her. Um, this isn't to say that the story that my kids learned wasn't real. But what the civil rights movement understood very well is sometimes reality needs to be performed in order for it to make a good image and a good story, which will then be reproduced and distributed around the world, which is exactly what happened with this photo. The other thing, Steve, I haven't told you this before, but when I was at the San Francisco Art Institute, there they talked in photo classes about the difference between taking a photo and making a photo. Uh-huh. Right? So taking a photo is like what photojournalists do. It's an approach, but what often what artists do is make a photo, right? Good. And I think Rosa Parks is making this photo, right? There's other people that are behind the camera pressing the button, but she's like a year later, okay, I want to tell this story. I'm going to sit for this and we're going to set this up in a certain way. Exactly. I mean, look at her face and look at that, you know, what she's doing at that moment. Yeah. Um, you understand. Yeah. So the principle there is about performing reality. Um, you want to take the next one? Yeah. And just to say too, that, uh, you know, to emphasize what Steve said is like, when we think about perform performing, we often think of fiction, but there's also performing nonfiction. Right. And that that's what's happening here. Um, so these are, uh, you know, famous photos from Birmingham in 1963, uh, where the Southern Christian Leadership Conference held this campaign. And a lot of our images of the brutality of the civil rights movement come from this demonstration in these few days. So this one of men being attacked by police dogs, uh, this one of children being marched off to jail as part of the Children's Crusade. Um, and, and then, of course, uh, these photos of protesters being assaulted by fire hoses. Um, now, a thing to know about this is that the, they tried to organize something like this earlier in Georgia. And what the police chief did there was round everyone up, put them in jails all over the state, you know, like a few here, a few there, and then let them out at different times. So there was never like a, a coalescing. There was never a big gathering. Um, and so the organizers got together and were like, okay, well, that didn't work. What we need is to show like the, the, the just violent uh, <laughs> backlash to this, right? How are we going to do that? And someone identified this guy, Bull Connor, in Birmingham. And they said, Bull Connor is a former Klansman. Um, also, at the same time, he had just been kind of voted out of office. And so he's in a way like a lame duck public safety officer who was in charge of the police and the fire department. Birmingham also had a long history of labor organizing. There were church bombings that happened there. Um, and so they said, well, this is going to be a really heightened place. And this guy has every reason to overreact when we go there. So we're going to sort of set up the situation and he's going to play the villain. Right. And so the result was the images that we know now, which is images of black decency and courage, people in their Sunday best, you know, still straight faced, um, facing down this brutality. And uh, those images were taken and then broadcast around the world during the time of the Cold War, where the Soviet Union was saying like, oh, these, this is the land of freedom, right? And so this is deeply embarrassing. This was on the front page of the newspaper in the USSR, in Japan, around the world, and deeply embarrassing to the federal government, right? Um, again, taking a picture, making a picture, the Southern Leadership Conference was making this picture, right? Um, so uh, this was a brilliant and creative act of what Douglas McAdams calls uh, strategic dramaturgy, right? Like we're going to set a stage, we're going to create a drama. And one year after this, 
the Civil Rights Act was passed. So um, one of the things that artistic activism can do is what we call making the invisible visible. This violence the, the, um, the, was largely invisible to the federal government, to white America, partly because they were ignoring it, but also partly because it happened at night. It happened at different places spread all over the country. It happened, um, it happened where there weren't photographers. And so in creating these kinds of images, they got them in the news and like kind of pushed things forward um, and did it in a very deliberate way. These are the uh, lunch counter sit-ins in Greensboro, North Carolina. And again, you know, this was the uh, one of the first in the country. There's like a couple that you can point to earlier. But, um, you know, we know these photos. Um, we know this action. Uh, this is a bunch of white young people and older people um, accosting and humiliating the people sitting at the lunch counters. But one of the things I was really fascinated to learn was that they thought of this also as a performance, right? They thought of it as something that they actually needed to rehearse. So they used, I believe this happened in the, uh, at, at UNC Greensboro, but they found these rehearsal spaces for themselves and they would practice. So blowing smoke in each other's face, splashing water on each other, ashing cigarettes on top of each other's heads. And there's some great video, which I wish I had because, um, it's like three of them standing there trying to be straight faced and then all their friends being like, you're disgusting, you know, just like screaming the worst stuff they can at them. And they can only do it for so long before everyone just starts laughing. Like you can imagine you and your friends trying to yell the worst thing at your friend and like, you just can't do it for that long. And they all start busting up laughing and they're practicing this stuff and still having a great time. Right. And then going in prepared because you can imagine like how terrifying this must have been, right? Um, so knowing that you have the support and preparing and yourself for it was really important. So another idea behind this is thinking of protests as a form of performance, yeah. right? And we have a friend, uh, David Solnit, um, who in a way was responsible for the look and feel of the Seattle protests, who once said to us, Steve's, all protest is performance. Just a lot of it is a really bad performance. <laughs> and so one of the things that we're really interested in is what are those examples of protests which are good performances and how can we work with other activists so their protests are good performances? Um, Steve, we have a lot more to do, but I think we should just go to questions at this point. Um, yeah? Yeah, okay. I, think, I think so, just because I'm cognizant of the time, and I know that you have some family responsibilities. I do. Um, so, uh, but you know what? I can show some images from the book. Oh yeah, please. Remember, well, we people made a book. are um, putting any questions in the chat, um, which we can respond to. Um, Steve's going to show some images of the book. The great thing about the book is, you know, um, it's got a lot of pictures. Steve um, made all the illustrations. Uh, when we first think about it, is how do we get out of playing copyright? Um, you know, that Rosa Parks picture is going to cost us a lot of money, but not if we draw it. Um, but it turned into kind of almost a, um, a counter story, not even a counter story, a, a compendium, a sort of a thing that goes along with all of the words, sometimes illustrating it like here, but sometimes rubbing up it against it. And so what I love about this, and I could say, honestly, because I'm not the one who did all the drawings, is the drawings bring this book to life. And that was something we struggled with. How do you work, go move from a workshop to a pen and paper book? Um, well, illustrations help. Um, it also means that if you get really bored with the writing, you can always look over and there's going to be some illustration to be looking at. Yeah, there's also a lot of jokes. Yeah. Which some about. of you, uh, well, yeah, we could show some of those, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's the one that will get us banned. Uh, yeah. But, but I do, we do want to talk about this very briefly, which is, I don't know if you saw that, remember that list we had of history. The last one we talked about is the dark side. Um, and this is something to take into uh, real consideration, real account, which is the most successful artistic activists for the past hundred years have not been on the side of peace and justice um, and equality 
and uh, they were the Nazi party. Um, from the very get-go as a destabilizing force to the moment that they took power and then tried to stabilize um, their sort of horrific vision of the world, they used signs, symbols, stories, and spectacles. And it is no accident that Adolf Hitler was an artist. Um, in fact, he writes about later that um, he was rem continued to think of himself as an artist. It's just that politics was the medium in which he expressed himself, no longer sketching little pretty dreadful sketches on the streets of Austria. Um, and that's just something to take into account. And one of the chapters in this book is about ethics. Um, when you start playing with people's emotions, when you start mobilizing their desires um, and their fears, although we argue against that, um, you're playing with powerful stuff. And so it really have to over and over ask yourself, okay, this can work, it can be effective, but is it the type of world we want to bring into being? And so we, you know, one of the things we always um, counsel the people we work with is imagine the world you want to bring into being. Is this act that you're doing that may mobilize people at this moment, is it going to mobilize the type of emotions that you want in your new world? Um, Steve, I think Michael's asking for the URL for Oro Books. Um, but does anybody have any questions for us? I know we laid out a lot for you. Um, and, you know, it's cool if we don't have questions, but we want to kind of open up a space for it. Richard Myers has has a question, I see. Oh, really? Why am I not seeing it? Yeah, thank you. Just a, a comment, which both of you could respond to, hopefully. But first of all, thank you, Steve and Stephen, for not only an informative, but at very times very touching um, exposition of, of what art can do. Um, <laughs> I think it goes without saying for people that understand how change occurs in our current climate, we need to go beyond um, left brain to right brain, beyond yang to yin. We need to find those interconnections and the holistic aspects of things because people tend to respond to that deeper humanity that's behind logic and argument. Um, I've seen like recent studies of people who are um, opposed to uh, vaccinations, use of masks, people who are opposed to recognizing human roles and climate change and so on. The more facts you give them, the more you argue with them, the deeper they dig in yeah. and, and the, where they're at. But they do respond. If you dig down to a deeper psychological level and try and understand and ask them questions about what, um, you know, what is it that brought them to this point of view or to, you know, even getting active about it and so on? And there's usually some grievances. Mm -hmm. uh, and oftentimes mm -hmm. those are, are human grievances. We yeah. may agree with some of them, we may not agree with some of them or whatever, but there's human grievances. So if you can break down that logic barrier and attempt to try and convert people and lecture at them and so on, oftentimes you can, you can reach some of these people. I'm not saying all of them all the time. But, you know, you can, you can reach some people, at least get them to think about things a little bit. And, and um, it strikes me that what you've shown is, you know, that art, you know, is really good. You know, good, effective art is really good at um, performing that kind of task that we can, um, you know, touch that deeper psychological dimension of existence, which we all share, which we're, we're going to have to find in each other if we're ever going to build a better society. We're going to have to find a way to touch that and bring that together. So, you know, the instances you showed, I think, illustrated that very well. So if you want to comment on any of that or, you know, add anything else to what you said, I appreciate it. You're absolutely it. wrong, yeah. Richard. <laughs> no, no. You're at, uh, <laughs> we well, I'm going to dig in now. Uh, you're you're yeah. just no, much yeah. with me. <laughs> we couldn't agree. We actually, we couldn't agree more. Um, and there's actually a chapter in the book on cogn cognition. Um because this is exactly one of the things that motivated us is we kind of did this out of instinct. And we were doing a workshop in Boston one time and someone said, hey, you know, a lot of what you're talking about is in line with the latest um, cognitive theory. Um, and we're like, no, we didn't know that. And we asked her to send us a whole bunch of books. <laughs> um, and we actually did a deep dive into this because exactly that, Richard. And I think we all know by instinct, but actually cognitive science backs us up, is that, you know, what you're describing there is um, you know, confirmation bias, for example, um, the doubling down in what you already believe and only seeing those things. Um, Steve, you're, you do, you love this, this world. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I was just going to say in the book, there's a, we kind of make a joke about it that we call this like the Matlock method of, uh, <laughs> of activism, where it's like, I'm going to make this case and I'm going to present it and I'm going to line everything up. And when I say it just the right way, it'll be like the end of the episode of Matlock. I just lay it all out there and everyone will be like, wow, okay, you know, 12 people on the jury and we can con condemn uh, capitalism. Um, but uh, yeah, <laughs> there it is. So, um, but, you know, we know that doesn't work. And, and if you ever try to have a conversation at a wedding or, or a Thanksgiving table and just try to present facts, you know how well it works. So, um, but, you know, what was interesting for me coming from the arts is figuring out, especially like in film, um, there are like Russian filmmakers in the 20s that figured out that these like associative meanings would actually cut through a whole lot better. And then how we can do that now. Um, and the other thing I, I would say is that as an artist too, like thinking about surprise, that when you get into, there's something about like a debate where like you kind of know what the other person's going to say and you're just in a, a pattern of back and forth. Um, and so being surprising is actually really important and really valuable because when people are confused a little bit about what's going on, actually, yeah, comedy is also a form of surprise, right? Like the way that comedy works is, uh, you know, a joke is like, I tell you a setup. This is a, my favorite example. The, uh, a guy comes into the library and he says, uh, yeah, I'd like to have a piece of pizza and a beer. And the librarian is like, sir, this is a library. And he says, oh, I'm sorry. I'd like to have a piece of pizza and some beer. <laughs> and the, 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 you've got like the first story, which is the setup, and it takes you down one way. And then the surprise is like, you know, you're like, okay, this guy's dumb. And then like the second part of the story is this person is dumber than you can ever imagine. So, um, so that kind of surprise when people don't know what's going on and something's unexpected, like that's when you're paying attention and that's when you're learning. Um, and I think Steve and I too, from teaching and all the different levels of education and types of schools that we've taught in, you know, if, uh, if you are not surprising, um, students don't, don't pay attention. So, um, so the arts have that, right? And uh, well, I'll say one other thing too about the arts, there's a trap with the arts where if like people understand something as a protest, they're like, oh, that's a protest. Like, I don't even know what it's about. I get it's a protest, right? Same thing happens with art. <laughs> so I'm in a museum and I see a sculpture and I'm like, what is this about? I think about it for a minute and then I don't know, but it's art, right? And like I can categorize it as art and I can stop thinking about it. But if you took that sculpture and put it in my bedroom while I was sleeping and left, you know, I wake up in the morning. I'm like, what is this thing? Who put it here? Why did they do that? What are they trying to tell me? What is, you know, what is it made of? All the things that I should be thinking about in the museum, but I don't because I, there's a reason I don't have to think about it. It's art, right? And so thinking about how when we do actions, when we talk to people, how we can kind of stay surprising and resist that kind of categorizing um, is really helpful in communicating to other people. Yeah. When we started looking into cognitive theory, one of the things we found out was that we not only um, think in patterns in terms of our mind, that is, we, uh, we, have, we say make associative links very quickly, and that makes, saves a lot of time, and it makes us very efficient, but there's actually start to get hardwired into our brain. Um, or soft wired into our brain. So it actually these, these connections are part of the way that we move through the world. And those immediate associations that, that Steve was talking about, oh, this must be art, oh, this must be a demonstration, I'm not political, I'm not gonna listen to this, or I don't understand art, I'm not gonna look at that. Um, what surprise does is it breaks those, and it breaks those and opens up a moment for you to kind of reorient someone, and over time, perhaps, jar them in such a way is that they can actually start to remap their brains. Um, uh, so wait, we got a couple of things about comedy. So we didn't show you because we ran out of time. One of our favorite examples, which actually is the um, actors from the American Indian movement who take over Alcatraz Island in 1969 and they issue a manifesto. And what's great about that manifesto, Steve, maybe just, can you uh, rewind, bring it up? 
Yeah. Um, is it, I'll do the setup now. You can imagine if there's one group and there's many groups, okay? But a group in the United States has the least reason to be good humored about their treatment. It would be American Indians. Um, yet they take this, uh, uh, they take uh, uh, Alcatraz Island over um, and they issue a manifesto. And here's how the manifesto goes. We, the Native Americans, reclaim the land known as Alcatraz Island in the name of all American Indians by right of discovery. All right. We wish to be fair and honorable in our dealings with the Caucasian inhabitants of this land and hereby offer the following treaty. We will purchase said Alcatraz Island for $24, $24, in glass beads and red cloth, a precedent set by the white man's purchase of a similar island about 300 years ago. We know that $24 in trade goods for these 16 acres is more than what was paid when Manhattan Island was sold, but we know that land values have risen over the years. And then they go on to say why Alcatraz Island will be the perfect Indian reservation. And they list all of these lists and uh, these reasons, right? And again, why are they doing this? Um, why are they actually issuing a manifesto over this serious takeover to draw attention to the condition of Native Americans in this country by using humor? It's because it will get people to pay attention. When you laugh, you stop for a second and you open up. And also the thing about comedy, which Steve and I talk about a lot, is it takes two people for a joke to work. And we all know that when we watch a comedian bomb, but if the joke works, you make a joke and I laugh, we've actually built a connection with one another, okay? When someone's lecturing at me in the park, um, I can listen, but there's no connection between me and that person, right? Um, but if I laugh, someone's made me laugh, all of a sudden we've created this bond within one ourselves. Um, so we're, we're big fans of using comedy. So let's see the chat here, because we... Um, Michael, I think you're next. Yeah, I, 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 was, I wrote Stack just to get some more people asking questions. But before me, Claire said that there is a real impact on trolling Bojo and his government. Uh, we don't get much coverage of that, Claire. Uh, what, what goes yeah, on? Yeah, can you tell us that? Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> recently there's a, a, a comedian called Joe Lysa, and uh, oh yeah, sorry. yeah, you, uh, and you, have you heard about this? Yeah, uh, yeah. There's apparently an investigation going into all these parties that Bojo had um, while the rest of the country was locked down, um, and it, more and more of these parties is, are sort of coming out, and so they've commissioned a woman called Sue Gray to do the investigation. Now, people have complained because they think she's too close to the government. It's like he's, you know, he's, get, he's commissioning a woman who he knows to do it. But um, so what Joe Lysett did was he was, he's got quite a big Twitter follower and he went on Twitter and he had a letter and it was headed with Downing Street and all kinds of like uh, official um, logos and stuff. And he said, he said, breaking, you know, he's got this leaked letter from Sue Gray um about what was going on and but apparently he started getting messages from parliament because mps ministers had believed it and were and were crapping themselves and so he disrupted what was going on and and what what was great about it is that everybody loved it so he got so much media attention for that um and kind of it, it made people realize that things aren't as kind of authoritarian as as they you know you can by by being clever and using satire and whatever you can you know make waves and there's also another lady who um she's called rosie holt and she's a comedian and she's on twitter as well but what she does is um she'll pretend to be a right wing person who's sticking up for the government or sticking up for boris johnson but her script is so bizarre um it, it she it just makes a complete mockery of it all and but some people believe it as well and it's just so clever and it's creating so much attention here you know these kinds of uh, it's not just the comedy it's the writing it's the writing and then it's the performance and um yeah it, it, it's it's just showing up the government everywhere and 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 the, the tory party generally so 
I think comedy yeah. is a great way to. I think Joe Lysett's a great example because he's been doing it for a long time. He, he, I've, the only way I know about him, I learned about him from another activist. And he was like, you have to see the show Joe Lysett's Got Your Back. And Joe Lysett's Got Your Back, he like takes on problems that people are having and then he'll try to help solve them. But he's in these like very weird, clever ways. But that he has like a lot of practice. And that's another thing that we try to talk about when uh, – when we work with activist groups is that, you know, you don't just like decide you're going to write the funniest joke or make a masterpiece, you know, you got to um, practice it and it takes time to develop and spend time on it. And so instead of thinking like, Oh, we're going to plan for uh, six weeks and then we're going to do this amazing March instead, you know, think about like, all right, well, let's do a draft of it. Let's do a, um a version of it and like see how it works and then refine it and like you know thinking about it how you would a sketch or rehearsals um and then over time you start to develop skills and i think you know you could throw joe lyset at this point at most problems and he would come up with something you know so um yeah it's a practice also yeah thank you claire yeah thank you claire and i was just thinking about because i've learned a lot about art working with steve is about sketches um you know, artists do a whole bunch of sketches and they put them up on the wall, see if they work and they don't. When I was an activist, we would plan for like six weeks for a demonstration. We didn't do little demonstrations to see, did this work? Did this not work? What does it look like from across the street and so on and so forth? We would just bet it all on the big demonstration. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't work, right? Um, and then we often wouldn't have a serious reflection after it about what are the components that do work. And so when we work with folks now, we really encourage them to do sort of mini actions and sketches, and then also take some of their team and have them be observers. And if we can, have them also be interviewers. Um, and so really getting a sense of what this looks like, not from inside, but actually from outside. What does it look like from across the street? Um, what does it look like? Does it make sense? And interviewing people and finding out how did they make sense of it? Did our jokes land? Um, did the visual metaphors that we're using actually work? And when it's a small little sketch, it doesn't take much to revise it. And so to think about kind of this long-term process um, is really kind of bringing not just art as a tactic, but the artistic approach to creativity into activism as well as a process. And there's a whole chapter, by the way, on process in here. Um, <laughs> which is about because if you're going to be creative, you got to have a creative process. Um, and so we take that very seriously. So Michael, you had a, you were in the list. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just wanted to ask, I mean, I, here we are from the Marxist education project and I've read a few things of Marx and he has a great sense of humor all, quite often yet so many Marxists, if you tell a joke in a meeting, really don't even want to hear from you. They like, you're shunned, you are stigmatized in some way, and and you, you are considered not a rigorous thinker or something like this. Um, and, and it makes me wonder, do you, the two of you with the Center for Activist Art, do people come to you? Do you look at things in the outside world? And when you engage with people, I, I assume, though I don't know if this is true, that a lot of this is you work with people and provide ideas to find tools and then they can autonomously continue with their activist art. Uh, but I, I don't know how all that works. And uh, it would be interesting to know. I mean, Steve, your, Steve Lambert's email address, just so everyone knows, is Steve something at CF. C4AA, which is Center for Activist Art. What is the Center for Activist Art and how does it relate to broadening our movement in whatever way? And I don't right. want to go on too much because Jurassica and Sean have uh, important stack points too, but I, I, I'm just curious. How does, sure, sure. how does one get Marxists to laugh? So uh, I would say, you know, for in our circles, it's the opposite. If there's someone who's deadly serious and can't laugh, we shun them and they, <laughs> but, um, um, 
You know, uh, we also try to make it clear, you know, from the very beginning that we don't take ourselves too seriously and that um, really wild ideas are welcome and that when there's a dogma, it's hard to, uh, you know, come up with. You, that's a rough environment to be creative in. Um, the other thing, though, that, uh, and, and Steve can address this, I'm sure, pretty briefly, but uh, is that we really tried to cut down the way that we teach into a, a, like a, a framework or a methodology. Cause you know, when we go to a place like South Africa or Macedonia or whatever, like the first time we went to Macedonia, I always tell people like, I didn't actually understand that it was a country. I thought it was like, I remember it from seventh grade social studies, but I didn't know it was a nation. And you know, who am I to come and say uh, the way that you solve this is, I know, right? So um, instead, I, I am very clear about the expertise I have with artistic activism, but also clear about the boundaries I have of, I've never been here before. I don't really know how it works. Um, so then that becomes a more collaborative relationship because we can't do anything without us exchanging information as m more like peers. But We like to say, uh, I mean, culture is the medium of artistic activism. And all people have culture, but they all have different cultures. And so you actually, the, the key with artistic activism is this notion that providing a framework, which then gets actualized by people on the ground who are the real experts about whatever culture they're working with. Um, but about, you know, Marxist jokes, I'm just going to read this from the beginning of German ideology. As we hear from German ideologists, Germany has in the last years gone through an unparalleled revolution. Principles have ousted one another. Heroes of the mind overthrow each other with unheard of rapidity. In the three years of 1842 to 1845, more of the past was swept away in Germany than at all other times in three centuries. Set up. Punchline. All of this was supposed to have taken place in the realm of pure thought. But oh, boom. Drop the mic, Marx and Angles. Um, that they were funny. They were funny. I mean, that's really, really funny. Okay. Um, you know, one, we are partly my interest in humor has to do with purely instrumental reasons. If you can't make people laugh, they're not going to come to your meeting. They're not going to join you. They're not going to have, you know, if you can't make people dance, they're not going to be part of your revolution. You know? <laughs> All right, let's get Jurassica. Hi. Hi. Um, I have a question that is like kind of, I don't know, I, I'm still trying to figure it out and I've still been trying to like articulate it in my head, but um, I come from a nursing background and during COVID, um, like kind of took a step back away from that and have kind of switched into um, a more like creative path and sort of in doing so, I've taken like a lot of classes with the MEP and have been reading a lot of Mark's more seriously than at other points in my life. And I now am working as an artist in like the NFT space. Uh -huh. And um, so I guess my work kind of is a, centers around like envisioning utopia, but also like commenting also on like the ridiculousness of our like North American food culture and materialism. Um, and I think I sometimes toe the line between like, um, glorifying versus like really critiquing which is like where I'm coming from mm. and and I wonder like uh, just like if you have any advice about like how to for for any artist right it doesn't have to be like in the nft space but for like people that are artists and maybe are trying to like move their art from just like something that feels like flat like aesthetics mm. Um, maybe even like nostalgic into something that feels um, transformative. And I know that's like a huge question. I know it's like what you're trying to do, but um, I'm giving my context just maybe that like helps to think about something in a different way. But yeah. And then also, I guess like as artists, like how you recommend artists navigate the world of like um, ha having themselves to be like actually making commodities. Right. But then also trying to be like, critiquing um at the same time it's like i don't ever want to charge people when i'm when like the piece of art that i'm saying is like minimum wage should be 44 dollars an hour you know and it's just like that's that's the piece um 
And so sometimes like, I'll just have like, that's that there's free stuff. And then there's like stuff that I hope that sells so that I can um, sustain myself as an artist. And that feels liberating in and of itself for me. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you just have any like advice for maybe not me specifically, but like in general for artists that are just looking to like, I don't know, like make that jump and are maybe feeling like stuck on the other side. And, and I think it could be like activists or, or artists and like how to just really like make something that feels transformative, if that makes sense. This is a great question because I think it's why we wrote the book. <laughs> you know, it's like for, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we would try to cover that kind of thing in the workshop, but um, it, we, can only, we could only reach so many people. And it's why we started the Center for Artistic Activism. Like there was a point where I was in a position you were in where it's like, okay, I'm, I know how to make this stuff, but I want it to actually have an impact on the real battles that I'm fighting in the court system. Right. And so how do I do that? And it was just so hard to find the information. And it took 20 years, you know? And so, uh, you know, the, the, I think that's a, reason that people uh, one of the great reasons people make books is that you to consolidate that knowledge so people can build on it and move forward um steve what do you want to say i can tell you got a thought cooking no uh, i just what about commodities come on you got i know no that's exactly where i was going to go look way back when when it was the new york market school our biggest funder was a tailor on wall street Every day, he would measure the crotches of people on Wall Street and give them really fine clothes. And it allowed him to generate an income, which he could then donate to the Marxist school. So why am I telling you this story? Sometimes you do have to sell shit. Um, some, you have to make a living. Um, if you're going to be an activist, and I learned this from my dad, who you know, was an activist from 1948 until about five years ago when he died, you just have to be in it for the long haul which means figure out a way to support yourself. I'm glad you're a nurse because nurses can get hired at any price at any time. Um, and then say, this is what I'm going to do. I am an activist. I am an activist artist. I am going to do it in any way, shape or form. Probably shouldn't sell the pieces that say, you know, about minimum wage. Although Steve has sold stuff which is critical, you know, for lots of money. And I know maybe you want to talk about that. Maybe you don't want to talk about that, but I know you've thought a lot about it. Yeah, my one tip is never meet the people that are buying your stuff. <laughs> it, I was like, why am I working so hard to decorate your home? Why, what, you know, and, um, but, uh, you know, yeah, I think that, that, like, actually, I've written about this before about, you know, like, I have a background that was very financially precarious. So part of the way that I existed for a long time was like, to be making money all these different ways so that if anyone dropped, I would have another way of surviving. Um, but um, this is also why we put the ethics section in the book because it's, these are tough questions and there aren't rules, right? Like if there was a rule, like if you make this much, you should give this percentage or, you know, like, but there's not. And, and, or this kind of job is okay. And this isn't like, there's not like, that's the hard thing is you got to figure that out. And it's a, one of the fucked up things about our society. But, um, and, and two, ethics, ethics is a practice. It's, uh, it's not a set of rules. It's ethics are when our values come into conflict and how we resolve it. And so um, what we did was come up with a bunch of um, sort of thoughts and provocations about how do you answer these questions? And so, you know, one of them, just as an example, I don't know that it applies so much to this specific situation, but you know, if you're planning an action and you're afraid that people will find out that you're behind it, it's probably maybe something to think about, right? Like, is that really what you want to be doing? Unless you're in China and then you right. Right. <laughs> right, right, right. and cover for yourself. Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, yeah. So, um, or, you know, for me, it's like, if I, I, I talk, I my mom's still alive and I talk to her and if she's like, you know, then I like double check it. Sometimes she's wrong. Sometimes she's right. But, you know, like, or uh, another thing we have is like, um, if your action was a person, would you want to hang out with them? <laughs> right? That's if your action's cool. super aggressive or pedantic or whatever, you know, like, no, nah, I don't want to hang out with that person. So um, anyway, things like that, 
that like can I think help clarify this stuff. Um, and I wish it was a simple answer, but um, unfortunately we do have an answer. It's just not a simple one. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Jess. Yeah. Um, Sean, did you have something? Uh, yeah, it's it, it's just it's been a great, um, a really great um, show that you're put on here, and I just wanted to just throw out a couple of other things about you said something about the most successful artist, uh, which just was a phrase, the most successful um, artist activist was Hitler and the Nazis, right? And I would say, well, you know, in in the United States, we sort of have the whole advertising phenomenon that starts with uh, the selling of World War One. Yeah. You know? And uh, right after the Hitler page is Edward Bernays. And, uh, and unfortunately, unlike Hitler, this thing is alive and well. Yeah. And uh, so, I mean, I grew up in West Beth in 1970. I was in it, it, my father. I grew up with, with artists on the Lower East Side, and my father got an apartment there. Pretty much the only thing he ever got from being a writer, right? And this was a time when people, you know, working class people actually could think of themselves as artists because it was cheaper to live in New York and, you know, people had gotten free educations, free training, you know, it was a, so it was a different era. But I remember in 1917, so I grew up with artists and I remember in about 1970, I was sitting in my bedroom in West Bend, 1971, and I was about 17 years old and I had just come from this demonstration in, uh, you know, at, at, at uh, Wall Street where my high school students, we were, we were attacked by the construction workers and people got beat up and everything like that. And I'm sitting in, I'm sitting in my room, my, my father's apartment, because I was living with him. And I'm saying, I have, a, I have one pamphlet here by Lennon and I have, you know, the autobiography of Sean O'Casey because my father had named me after Sean O'Casey, right? And I'm saying, fuck these artists, you know? I'm going with Lennon. Because the fucking artists have no fucking power to do sh jack shit. So I said, fuck art. I'm going with Lennon, right? And I was like 16 or 17 years old. Over the course of the years, I think that you guys, what you're doing here, the importance of art, the importance of culture to a people's movement, I've always, I've seen it being in movements and being in struggles. So it's, and, it, and the thing about humor, it's like, in America, humor, the, the humor comes from the left, pretty much, this, yeah. or from a progressive crit critical space. And it's very tolerated. You know, yeah, like this, yeah, yeah. this show, you know, it's, it's, it's a big winner on television. You know, the yeah. big, some famous comics, they're making a fortune. They're very, they're superstars, right? Yeah. So humor is very much allowed. And you can be very critical, uh, yeah. you know, in humor. So it's, and, you know, it's like, so, and then the whole thing about Twitter, you know, it's like getting the catchy meme, getting the catchy little thing on, uh, you know, on, on uh, these different uh, things that we have now. It's like, it starts to be a little, I, I, almost saw, I almost veer away from it a little bit, mm -hmm. not from what you guys are talking about, but you can see about how this whole psychological profiling and it's like, what we're going to sell you because we're always being bombarded with something that you could, the, world, the society bumped up, bards us. You're selling this, you're selling, you're selling breakfast cereals. Mm -hmm. Sugar, sugar wins, sex wins. You know, they got it figured out about how to, how to market. So for you to like push back at some of the dogmatic Marxists that are humorless and these demonstrations that are boring as shit, you know, it's like sometimes they can be boring as shit even if they got 100,000 people there. You know, right, right, right. it's like, you know, it, it's not really like, it's not really making, you know, it's not really hitting home, like you say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like, I, I'm with you that, on the... Uh, this superficial kind of thing, too, about manipulation. Like, yeah. you know, yeah, we want culture. We want, you know, song. We want music. We want humor, satire. But we don't, it's not like we're competing with the fucking ad industry, to like, and, you know, to try to create, you know, to try to create some kind of meme that's going to like, you know, psych you out and bring you over to our side. Because that seems very shallow. Yep. And that well, seems, you know, like, oh, my God. Ugh. Well, that's, that's you know? again, it goes back to the ethics, because we actually, right yeah. after we talk about Hitler, we talk about advertisers. Um, and th there is a persuasion industry. Um, 
However, we also believe in ripping people off um, and, and stealing as much as humanly possible from all sorts of folks. I mean, the thing about the advertising right. industry is that there's a lot of really smart people who are working. And one of the reasons that ACT UP and Grand Fury was such this breath of fresh air is a lot of people came from the advertising industry and then brought that smarts in the design industry into a social movement. So we do think you can borrow from that, but you do have to be careful. Okay. And because advertising was created to sell us products. Right. Um, and so we don't want to sell revolution as a product. Um, we don't want it to just be a commodity, which, you know, is like, yeah. And that, ha that happened in the late sixties is the revolution became a sort of commodity and then it could be easily controlled. So going back to what Steve said, none of this is like, follow this and it works. It's all about a constant, I'm appropriating this. Is it working? Is it worth doing what I want it to do? But keeping your eyes on the prize of the revolution. Yeah. Um, on that note of the revolution and my love of Lenin, both Lenins, <laughs> <laughs> um, I know that we have to go. Um, and so, Steve, do you have any final words of wisdom? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I read, promise. Read, read the conclusion of the book. Oh, yeah. Before you do that, though, because that's a great ending. Um, the uh, thing I was going to say, oh, Claire asked, you know, what is the is artistic activism a movement of sorts? Does it mean? I, and I would just say that um, it's just it's a thing that people have always done. And what Steve and I, I think maybe are like putting a name to it. Um, you know, and that's part of that history thing. But the Center for Artistic Activism is, uh, is just to clarify that, is a nonprofit. Um, we've been around for about 12 or 13 years. And we do, part of the book emerged from these trainings that we gave um, in those places all over the world that we, sh we showed earlier. And refining and refining and refining and to the point where we're like, okay, we can't do this 15 people at a time anymore. Like we need to write this down. And, uh, but we still do those workshops and um, we still do trainings around the world and we give away a lot of stuff for free and all of it is at the uh, website, which I'll, I'll post here. Um, and we have a great newsletter that updates people on things we're doing. Um, so there's that. And um, Steve, why don't you take yeah. it away? So Steve actually wrote, read the first paragraph. So I'm gonna read the last paragraph. Yeah. And then I'll show you the illustration, which is one of my favorites. There are many books you can find about art, activism, creativity, and combinations thereof. You read them, or at least the first chapters, maybe find a good quote to use, and then let the book sit on a shelf while you slowly forget it. We hope this isn't one of those books. Over the past 10 chapters, you've gone through the process, our workshop participants complete in becoming more effective artistic activists. Beyond just theories and concepts, we provided stories and examples and workbook exercises to practice these concepts. There's a downloadable workbook for free, which comes with this. By now you filled your sketchbooks and notebooks with your own thoughts, ideas, plans, and dreams. You could stop here. But the point of all this training and all your hard creative work would be lost. The point of this book is to put your creativity to use in changing the world. And that's only gonna happen if you put all these words into action. Or in the words of Karl Marx, all hitherto philosophy has tried to interpret the world. The point, however, is to change it. So that's an addendum that Steve just had. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was not that's not in the book. That's just from the thing. And there is uh, it starts out with um, with the white rabbit, and there we get to the end. And Alice reading under the tree, and at the end she's organizing the overthrow of the queen. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you all folks. Thank you. Michael, for having us on. Thank and you, and uh, we'll have to have you home. back next year for part two. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. All it right. Was really good, and uh, thank you very, very much. And everyone, get this book, and we'll work on projects together when we can start to see each other again. Oh, you thank can do you it before. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right. Hey, thanks a lot, everybody. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.